Hello and welcome to this new episode of the Shift Fit CJ podcast. I'm your host, CJ, and today I have a guest in the biohacking studio. My guest on the show today is a health coach, and her name is Kat. Everyone, please welcome Kat to the show. Thank you so much. Thank you How are so you much. feeling today? Feeling great. Uh, excited to have this chat. Well, I normally, everyone has a story. Everyone has a unique story. What's yours? Why did you get into health? You could get into anything. Yeah, well, at the beginning, I was in the health industry uh, myself throughout all my life because my family was uh, healthy and I was doing track and field uh, when I was younger. So I more or less was all the time in the field, uh, but I was lacking uh, the understanding, the proper understanding, and I was jumping from diet to diet. Mm -hmm. and um the, what was your favorite diet <laughs> my favorite diet i used to really um jump around this one type of food diets like only eggs or okay. only buckwheat for the whole day only apples okay and so those are pretty extreme diets they are and uh like none but of people do diets. but people do lose weight on them right because you know, they have the Twinkie diet. You can you can be eating this sugary junk all day, but still lose weight. Yeah, that does happen. I mean, yeah, in terms of calories in, calories out, if you mm. eat less, um, especially if you eat like only apples for the whole day, like you can maybe lose some water, but not necessarily mm -hmm. fat or, and you won't feel great. That's for sure. You could, in fact, have apple skins and lose a lot of weight. Did you know about that? Just apple skins for the whole day? No, but I mean, having a lot of apple skins, because I did this protocol about three years ago where I was having apple skins and apple skins specifically stimulate a certain kind of gut bacteria. And that gut bacteria is known to help you lose weight, increase immune cell activity. It also, it, because it's a fiber, right? So it yeah. feeds that kind of gut bacteria. Yeah. And um, I forgot the, the name of the gut bacteria, but there was a specific strand and one of the best ways to do this is to have at least two apple skins, two full apples, just take out the skin and just have that. But now we have other problems. You have to wash it properly because it's with fertilizers and chemicals yeah, and all of that yeah. stuff. Like only eat the skin in front of the apple? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why throw the apple? You can eat the apple as well if you like. <laughs> At that time, I was on a I was on a ketogenic diet, so I did not mm. uh, have ah, a lot okay. of sugar. But yeah, I I needed that fiber. So, what has been one of the most okay? So you you've had apples, you've had probably bananas, eggs, all these things. What has been one of the most craziest diets that you've come across, or the most shocking or hilarious? The most shocking, and hilarious. I think that that ones were the from the ones that I tried. That mm. was. Those that didn't really make much sense because mm -hmm. um, it sounds easy, but doesn't make you feel great. Doesn't really help you with anything. Just uh, and if you try to do it for the for the longer period of time, you're just gonna uh, be left off uh, with like a bunch of deficiencies and um, maybe even lost muscle mass. Mm -hmm. if you're eating only apples. Why do you think every year there is at least five new diets that come, and most of the world goes crazy on them? And they tried, why, what's there with the whole diet culture that is either attractive, even though when you look at the diet, you might think that this is ridiculous. Yeah. But people still try it. Yeah, that's the interesting question. But it really comes down to like, everybody wants a quick fix. Everyone wants this right now mm -hmm. and nobody really wants to look in the longer perspective and this is nobody's fault honestly this is just how we are structured how our brains are structured to think we want the reward right now we want mm -hmm. whatever we want right now so we're impatient are you calling we, the yes okay yes we can be impatient and um all of these diets, they what what they do? They say, yeah, lose weight in one week. You're gonna lose weight in two weeks, mm -hmm. and nobody talking about um, the fact that the diet is uh, just the meaning of the diet is the way you eat, but it it's the way you eat for the 
whole life. It's not the way you eat that has the beginning and the end. If it has the beginning and the end, then the results going to have the beginning and the end as well. Mm -hmm. So so that's why people do this whole yo-yo thing. They, yes. they go on a diet, they lose a bunch of weight, and then a month later, they gain all that weight back, maybe even more, correct? Yeah, even more, depending on the diet. Like if it was very restrictive diet, then of course, when your end date came, you're going to just double, triple, and uh, you're going to go crazy. And it's also not your fault because this is how we are structured mm -hmm. to uh, our body was so in stress and after we stopped it, it's uh, from thinking that we're at war or something, it mm. starts to think that we need to uh, collect all of this and uh, store even more for mm. the new episode of Yo-Yo. <laughs> okay, so yeah, that that's cool. That also makes sense from an ev evolutionary perspective because as humans all over the world, right now we're lucky enough that we have a lot of these food availability. Right now, you and me or anyone listening to this can open up an app on their phone and in 30 minutes, they might get their favorite pizza or, yeah. you know, let's keep it healthy for this conversation. Maybe get a acai bowl or a salad. But it hasn't been like this for from the beginning of time because we had to hunt or move or forge and get all of those calories in. But our bodies would never know that is the next calorie going to come or not. And especially in areas of the world where uh, non-tropic areas especially areas where you're from where there is going to be enough the the extreme temperature also doesn't allow us to get enough food and that's one more reason why people put on so much weight because you're right the body is intelligent enough to understand yeah. that this is the only chance to feast because there might be a famine for a very long time yeah correct yeah that's correct it it starts to store everything because it understands that this is the pattern now. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be deprived again. I need to take everything I can from this food. I store everything. I'm not going to, and it's also going to push you into uh, burning less calories. So you're going to be less active. You're going to um, burn less calories into like normal day to day, like so your metabolism goes down. Yeah, metabolism goes down, and you start to like fidget more and move, um, fidget less and move less in general. Mm -hmm. Like if um, I I'm good and I'm have enough calories and my body wants to burn it, I'm like energetic. I just went to the gym. I will be unconsciously just standing up moving my hands or mm. like tapping my leg. Uh, I'm going to be like this because my body wants to uh, burn all of this extra energy. That's actually how people lose weight a lot. And this is actually why um, very low calorie diets don't work because mm. they do this to you and you start unconsciously lowering your energy expenditure because this is um, just how brain overrides us mm -hmm. uh, in this this way it's interesting a lot of the times people who are trying to lose weight they try to go to the gym and exercise but actually what studies have found that the main thing that makes them lose weight is exactly what you're saying it's called neat non-exercise yes. activity thermogenesis which means fidgeting around moving around walking you know even moving your leg or your hand or chewing gum whatever yeah. all of these all of these activities that actually burn a little bit of calories, but throughout the day is much more important than going to the gym for one hour and killing yourself on the treadmill. Yeah, that's true. I heard that uh, those activities can burn up to like 1,000 extra mm -hmm. calories, 1,200. This is crazy in 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 this kind of amounts. Um, although every everybody's different and this um, numbers, they are so average. Mm -hmm. This is... This is why I don't really um, uh, look at the calorie ranges too much because of how subjective it can be. Mm -hmm. uh, because um, all of these numbers are derived, uh, like all of the people, and there's a range of people, and they just take the average. But mm -hmm. what if I'm on the top of the average, or what if I'm naturally uh, at the like the lowest point of this average? Then on top of that, the calories in food and the calories in the like burners mm -hmm. uh, 
like in our trackers uh, how, how so many... we're wearing a trapper she is wearing an apple watch and i'm wearing a whoop <laughs> yeah well apple watch because of the messages and the calls and the mm. music and um, i don't really look too much at the, the calories yeah well you know the thing is the way calories are defined and are measured they're actually measured in a in a device called a cali- calor- caloric bomb meter caloric bomb meter and they they have some chemical reactions where they put a food inside and they expose it to heat and some chemicals and it spits out a few numbers but yeah. the reality is that any any calorie that you estimate anything that you look behind a food label it could be wrong by 20%. Yeah. So 20% is the sort of ratio that you need to look at. So if you're looking at something that says 100 calories, it might be 120 calories or it might be 80 calories. But again, calories in versus calories out. But here's the question for you. What do you think is calories in versus calories out the most important thing when it comes to health, wellness, weight loss? Well, I think this is too oversimplified, calories mm-hmm. in, calories out. Uh, on this basic level, this is true. That's when you burn um, more that you consume, then you lose weight. When you um, uh, consume more than you burn, then you gain weight. Mm-hmm. Uh, sounds simple, but again, uh, when... Uh, they measure how much, uh, how many calories there are in food. This is just one uh, measurement where it can go wrong, you know, this 20%, but then how much you burn. So there's like this um, things that are, can go wrong are on both sides of the equation on the calories in and the calories out. When the in, it goes from the food itself from how you digest it, how is your metabolism, how is your microbiome, uh, did you uh, lose weight before, uh, did you restrict yourself before, um, and then colors out is uh, also how is your body burning calories. Yeah, the Apple Watch and the Whoop, they're also inaccurate, they have yeah, like a 15%. So, uh, so inaccurate. <laughs> they overestimate calories to make us happy. Yeah, that's true, that's true. So... Uh, I think meticulously uh, counting all of the calories can uh, can for some people can be a good indication if they don't mind, but some people can go actually crazy. Oh, I was one. You want to hear the story? Yes, I was one too. But <laughs> okay. you go first. <laughs> okay, so this was about two thousand and nine or two thousand and ten, about that time. So we're like thirteen years ago. And for some reason, this whole My Fitness Pal came up and <laughs> yes. everyone was like, wow, now you can, you know, and for people who are listening, people who are younger, back in the day, the apps wasn't like how it is right now. If you could measure something on an app, that was a big deal. So My Fitness Pal comes in and I think they're still in business. And for some reason, you look at this app and it tells you like, okay, you could put your like one apple, the size of the apple, the weight of the apple, and then it gives you x amount of calories so what i did was i bought a weighing scale and then i measured every food and put it on the app oh yeah and because (laughs) we could see numbers and i was gamifying it and yeah that triggered a lot of dopamine response in my brain but i started seeing a lot of changes because for sure i was cutting a lot of these calories and for the first time it wasn't really cutting off calories it was my understanding of how calories look in terms of numbers because before we just, we've always heard about, hey, this is high density, high calorie food. When you have a math calculation doing everything for you, it becomes different. And um, love and behold, I was addicted to that before social media. I was addicted <laughs> to my fitness pal. And I kept on, like there was times where I could, I was outside, but I wouldn't eat because I couldn't put the numbers inside. Yeah. So for me... Yeah, I got the six pack and, you know, eight, I went to 3.5% body fat without taking any steroids. But then I just realized this is a very sick way to live. It is. And <laughs> yeah, ever since that, but I am grateful to the fact that I went through these few months of this experiment because it gave me such a, it gave me such deep understanding that after I could, I'm not able to do it now, but before I could look at a food 
and tell you with 90% accuracy how much calories are on it. Yeah. And if you doubled it, what would happen? If you tripled it, what would happen? Every meat group, I would know, okay, turkey has four ounces, has 24 grams of protein, yeah. and the chicken breast has this, and the chicken legs have this. So yeah, it was an interesting uh, thing. Tell me yeah. your story. Well, my story is kind of the same, but I was never able to track too much of it. Like, I... Uh, I'm coming from the background of like a lot of emotional eating, uh, bulimia. I, my uh, tell people what bulimia is. Bulimia is when you are eating, when you're overeating, and then you go and you throw up because you don't want to um, gain weight from it. Interesting. Yeah. So that's what I used to do. At, at first, I was just overeating. Uh, and dumping my emotions because I didn't know how to process emotions like what people do and uh, I found comfort in food and that was I was doing but then uh, I was exercising so much to burn it off because I didn't want to uh, I didn't want my body to change and then still because I was eating so much I, I started gaining 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 and that's when I started to like oh okay like I can't mm -hmm. stop that but maybe I can throw up and mm -hmm. then it's gonna work okay so you use that logic how many so you see a lot of clients and you know you're a coach and we have to come to that part of it but um how many people do you estimate have gone through a similar path or a similar problem how many people do you estimate just especially when it comes to emotions because you know food is such a comfort that's why they say comfort food right it is yeah how many people do you think are not addressing their emotions correctly and putting it all on food i think uh the majority maybe even especially women i see it's a huge issue with emotional eating and actually this is tied to then everything because everything is connected and uh, more and more people more and more women are getting stuff like PCOS and uh, fertility problems. Mm. And while they, it may be um, like, we, we never know, like PCOS, we don't, we don't know. Like nobody knows really what's the cause of it. Mm -hmm. uh, inflammation. Yeah. Huh? Inflammation. Inflammation. I mean, where the inflammation coming from? Like what did. From that food that they're eating. What are they eating completely A healthy? lot of sugar. <laughs> It's it and can be one. It yes. can be one, but it's it may not. I have PCOS, but I don't need sugar. A lot of carbohydrates, mm. stress. It yes, all of this. Mm -hmm. But you can be uh, completely healthy, and you can still have it. Mm -hmm. And I had it all my life, like since the beginning of my uh, menstrual cycle. Mm -hmm. At the age of like twelve, I like they just put this. A diagnosis just, on me you just give that <laughs> give that as a gift <laughs> yeah yeah so and and for to me they all say like yeah you're healthy you're you're an athlete everything is great you know everything is okay but yeah what you said uh stress is one of the big um contributors and in inflammation of course inflammation also tied to stress yeah it's a it's a it's a it's like a vicious cycle. You get stress and your yeah. your body becomes inflamed and that inflammation yeah. drives more stress and then yeah. it just keeps on going. And then if you put any um, flame in the fire, which is either sugary treats or gluten or anything which yeah. is which will disrupt your digestion, then those endotoxins, they mobilize and then they get into the bloodstream and then that causes other endocrine problems and then you're now dealing with a lot of hormonal issues because yeah. adrenals are fatigued cortisol is high it's and it's it's yeah. similar in men as well a lot of the men they have a similar they of course they don't have pcos but you know they will get a lot of abdominal visceral fat uh gynecomastia which is like man boobs they have erectile dysfunctioning and uh, lots of high blood pressure but then men approach it in a different way because a they don't talk about it b they won't see a doctor and c they <laughs> yeah. will um they will result to alcohol mm. so i think more and more women would look to food first and yeah. then men would look at alcohol mm. and then they would try to like yeah. substitute the emotions over there or fighting on the street or that's true yeah men has a different approach to it um coming back to the emotional eating uh 
yeah, it's emotions that drives us to eat all this food and we become hooked on this and uh, because it gives us good little pleasure that we're seeking like this relief of the emotion that we think we relieved it, but actually we didn't do anything. We just ate and we made mm -hmm. it worse. So for me, it helped to figure out how can I release my emotions without food. Mm -hmm. They come to an understanding that I'm doing this and this is not cool and I need to find a way how can I name my emotions, identify that they're coming because most of the times before I used to get an urge to binge and with a split of a second I'm already sitting on top of like five boxes of chocolate <laughs> and three bowls of pasta finished and I feel just terrible and I'm ready to like uh, explode because of the amount of food I just ate and then I cry because because of how how could I let this happen mm -hmm. but it it's like a switch like I go black out and I wake up only when it's done mm -hmm. so when what helped me is to identify when it's coming name the emotion uh in my practice people come to me with this problem a lot honestly yeah tell us what do you do so if someone is listening to this and they say like oh my god she's I resonate with her because <laughs> I have the same thing. The five boxes of chocolate are just there. What do you, where is a good starting point? Yeah, as I said, the good starting point is to realize that you're doing this mm -hmm. and start to stop, mm -hmm. take a break without judging yourself, without uh, beating yourself up, without trying to restrict yourself, but starting to slowly bring awareness to what you're doing and why you're doing this. Mm -hmm. to what caused you, what was the trigger, what was the emotion, um, what situation was there behind it. And it's not usually bad. Like it's not always the bad emotion that can be triggering this. Sometimes it can be also habitual. So with my clients, we have this like the whole practice. It's, I call it a trigger map. So trigger map, that's interesting. Trigger map, yeah. So we 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 bring awareness to um this event and we try to map everything that is happening around. How was your day? Who did you speak with? Like how was your mood? Like we name the emotions. And so we we see uh and try to look for the patterns. Sometimes um it can be even good emotions that can trigger this because you want to reward yourself or it's a habit or you every day uh, after work you go home and you put Netflix on and just because as a kid for example you used to go to the cinema and always eat popcorn mm -hmm. now every time you put the movie on you have to have popcorn isn't Even popcorn healthy uh depends on which kind of popcorn like okay. if you just normal popcorn, maybe not that bad, but if you add butter, mm. all the... Then the calories go up. Not even calories, but also fat content, saturated fat content. If you buy popcorn, which is like uh, flavored with whatever mm. oh, barbecue Oh, the delicious pizza, one. Yeah, of course. It's very good, but then... <laughs> Especially when you're looking, uh, when you're watching the movie, you can eat like a big yeah. bag of it yeah. and then there's nothing good about it. And this is... Is there any way to avoid it? Be being conscious, mm -hmm. being conscious about it. And so uh, one of the practices is you eat without distractions, uh, you eat slowly and um, with someone new. I'm actually uh, in... Um, in the process of producing my own meditation for 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 this so um kind of food meditation mm -hmm. so when you eat you close your eyes and you chew every bite and you think of this flavors and you, the texture and really notice all these things and this is just simple mindfulness about How do you do food. it when you're driving a car or you're you you don't know, rushing? Eat when you don't eat when you drive the car for once. Why? Because your uh, your focus is not there. Mm -hmm. 
your focus is on the road and your focus to maximize your digestion for your hunger uh, cues to be aligned and your satiety to kick in when it should kick in, not later. Uh, you should pay attention to what you're doing. When you're driving a car, you pay attention to driving a car. So it's just like watching a movie. You can eat so much more in a so much shorter amount of time. And it's easier to over it. And then your digestion is not going to be just great. So you shouldn't eat while you're watching TV as well? No. Okay. No, you shouldn't eat while you're watching TV, while you're driving. While working? Uh, while working, definitely not. But, but that's what everyone's doing, right? Most of the times you go around and you see either people looking at Instagram or social media and they're eating something in a food court or yeah. a place. You see most of the traffic jams, people have something, they're biting on something because they have to get to a meeting. Then if they're at home or you know they're watching a football match at a bar and they're just going and eating and you're yeah. saying that's don't yeah. do that don't do that if you have an emotional eating problem mm -hmm. i mean in general it's uh, not a good practice to be disconnected with your body and disconnected to what you do mm -hmm. um, but especially for people who have emotional eating problems especially for uh those who have digestive problems then it's definitely mm -hmm. something that you should give up and I completely agree. I completely yeah. agree. You have to, if you guys want to assimilate the right nutrients, get your food digested, like she said, give the right hunger and satiety signals. Make sure you focus on just eating your food. Have a conversation while you're eating. That I don't I don't know if you approve yeah. of that, but I do. Yeah. Have a conversation with someone, you know, but be mindful of what you're eating. Chew a lot. Yeah, true this is, a lot. And yeah, this is even in a lot of like traditional Eastern practices. Yeah. They always mention to chew your food at least 24 times. Yeah. And now science also tells us like 24 to 30 times is like the ideal thing to, because your digestion actually doesn't start in your stomach. It That's starts in your mouth. mouth. Yeah. So you have salivary enzymes that actually break up a lot of that food and they signal your gut to be prepared for that food to come. So if you chew, a lot let's say not a lot but 24 times then most of your digestion is already done yeah and it's much easier for your body to take in that steak or that vegetable <laughs> or that fruit but uh okay so talking about steak what i did not mention to you guys is that cat herself is a plant-based or should i call you plant-based coach or should i tell you a vegan or following a vegan diet or a plant-based diet is this is the same or yeah. there's there's some difference okay uh the different uh difference can be so that vegan is more of a lifestyle more of a choice because of the animals and plant-based can be basically meaning that you are eating mostly plants, but you're necessar not necessarily abstaining 100% from all animal foods. Like you don't eat even honey, uh, mm -hmm. you don't wear leather, you don't wear fur. Like, um, it's, So vegan it, yeah. is a much more strict version of a yeah. plant-based diet, like the most, I, like the most top yeah. version. I would say, I would say, uh, Plant-based um, can be interpreted more of a uh, diet mm -hmm. and dietary choices and vegan can be interpreted more on more broad levels that come to, again, like wearing uh, animals or like even um, using cosmetic products that like not test on animals. Yeah, like cruelty-free. Yeah, and... yeah, for this, for this reason. Okay. So, How long have you been vegan? Yeah, so I've been vegan. Uh, I've been plant-based first. No, first even I started as just vegetarian, then okay. um, first pescatarian, then vegetarian, uh, then plant-based, then... Uh, and now you've got your promotion and the promotion, you're vegan. Promotion, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a transition. It was uh, quite long mm -hmm. for me to get through all of the stages since I understood um when i since i got my reason to mm -hmm. do it 
Yeah, I think with veganism, everybody should have their own reason and uh, should be quite strong for them to want to go all the way down on the transition. Well, health-wise, if we speaking only about health, you don't have to be vegan. Like, it's not going to be harmful for your health to wear leather. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's maybe even be like protecting you from wind and uh, rain if you are driving a and motorcycle honey as well, right? Because honey can have some medicinal yeah, properties. Yeah, and, and honey too. So you don't have to be completely vegan for health. Mm-hmm. I came to understanding of that. But being plant-based, on the other hand, is very important because of you naturally have to uh, look for more diversity in vegetables and fruits and grains and nuts and legumes that you're eating and look at eating less of the animal products Mm -hmm. for your general health. Are all plant, so most of the times, let's, I'm going to be the devil's advocate, okay? <laughs> and again, while you're listening to this podcast, we want to make sure that A, this is not an argument. B, we both have different opinions that have worked for people that we know or, you know, in the literature. And there's always going to be enough evidence for all cases. But what we want to try to do here is to give you a better understanding of different points which will just generally educate you so this show is all about education and how people can improve their lives and listening to this please don't leave us a comment saying um, (laughs) veganism is this or you know whatever but let's, let's get into it one of the biggest things that a lot of people so just for the record i don't know many people know this i was vegan for about four years plus yeah i quit veganism in 2018 and yeah so I was vegan to four and a half years almost and then and I had my transition was one day I decided I'm going to be vegan and next day I was <laughs> vegan for the next four and a half years but um, yeah at that time I wasn't having a lot of honey but I wasn't very like uh, it, for me it wasn't a complete lifestyle Yeah, with food, I was completely strict and with a lot of other things as well. But I didn't throw away all my leather belts or I didn't throw away all of those things. I was very conscious on not purchasing them and not contributing to an industry that might support something else. But then I didn't want to throw all of my things. So I just kept it. Right. So one of the things that I got asked a lot is what about protein, bro? (laughs) So do you get... And we know if you're eating meat, you're going to have more protein, right? Yeah. But then there are all these vegan protein shakes and all that stuff. So if someone asks you about like protein, what do you say? I say that you can get enough protein on the vegan diet easily. Mm -hmm. I don't have any problem with it. Mm -hmm. It depends uh, how you approach it. And I think uh, whoever is on the vegan journey, I uh, have to understand um, the basics of nutrition and balanced diet more than um, somebody who is not vegan because it is very important to have the right balance mm-hmm. when you are vegan because um, what happens with most of the people who go vegan, they saw it like a documentary and mm. then they're like okay i'm gonna be vegan and yeah game changers yeah yeah and then they start thinking okay so what do i eat now um okay i'm gonna eat like salad leaves and rice and uh, rice with vegetables yeah that's mm. vegan that's cool i'm gonna eat that like three times a day and then what happens like you don't have enough protein uh you've been eating too much carbs so you start to have um maybe fiber overload even, Mm -hmm. and you start to have digestive problems. You were not prepared for that. You didn't do your transition and uh, you start creating deficiencies. And, and then people say like, Oh, okay. Veganism, veganism is bad. It's uh, makes me deficient. It made Mm -hmm. me sick. And uh, all of the vegans, you know, they're just not healthy people, Mm -hmm. but, did you actually research what you have to do? Did you actually try to make your um, meals balanced? 
uh, most people just don't do it. That's why most people fail on the vegan diet. But um, And the protein is something that's super important that you have to look for, especially if you're vegan. And um, when we look at vegan protein, um, most of it, like good lean protein sources can be, um, they're all soy, mm -hmm. tempeh, tofu, edamame beans, mm -hmm. as well. I say that the secondary because it's more processed uh, stuff like seitan mm -hmm. um, and textured vegetable protein, which is supplementary. Yeah, yeah. that's completely processed. I yeah, agree. that's processed. And uh, that's something that you can still have, mm -hmm. but it's not the focus. The focus is the soy foods and legumes. Mm -hmm. While legumes have also a lot of carbs, that's mm -hmm. where people get it wrong as well. They start eating just a lot of legumes and then they start yeah, getting... Yeah, because per calorie, the um, protein ratio is so less and the carb ratio is yeah. so high. Yeah, yeah. So there, there is protein in legumes, but many people get it wrong that they start eating like a lot of chickpeas and a lot of beans right yeah. away, lentils, and then they get bloated and they start getting uh, digestive issues as well because they just, they never ate it. And then they start all of a sudden eat a lot of it. And that may bring digestive issues. Even um, I would say even absorption issues because what happens is, in all ancient cultures, legumes, especially like beans and all of these things, they weren't bought from a supermarket and cooked and eaten. Yeah. They were soaked for hours. Soaked, they yeah. were sprouted and yeah. they were fermented. And why? Because most vegetables or most plant matter contain something called as anti-nutrients. Yeah. And anti-nutrients are this plant self-defense mechanisms because, yeah. you know, Plants have existed on this planet for more, more than 500 million years and more than animals and more than humans. And the reason that they have survived till now without having the ability to run away or to scare someone off or to punch someone in the face or to bite someone is because they are one of the most intelligent organisms on the planet. Yeah. And what happens is if an animal comes by and they want to eat the plant, firstly, plants have extremely, and this is proven by science, they have networks that can communicate when threat is yeah going to come so if your yeah. plant has been eaten 100 meters all the plants on this side already know that something is coming and what they do is they upregulate all of these anti-nutrient systems in their body or in their on the plant and because of that either the plant is very bitter or the plant will give the consumer which is an animal or a human really bad digestive issues so chances are that human or that animal is not going to eat that plant again. Yeah. And what I found out is that even one of the other things that we have to be very careful with is that most of this anti-nutrient rich plants have enzyme inhibitors, which means your digestive enzymes, your proteolytic enzymes, your enzymes that can move and digest fat, like all different kinds of enzymes. So when we have protein or any food, it needs to be broken down into amino acids. Yeah. And that is because of these enzymes. And these food groups have enzyme inhibitors. So most of the time, it doesn't matter how much spinach you're going to eat because it's got an enzyme inhibitor that inhibits iron absorption. That's yeah. why a lot of people who have spinach, they will have be deficient in iron because when they'll eat the most iron, one of the most iron rich foods. A lot of the times, people are not able to get you can eat the protein but you cannot assimilate it because it's got proteolytic enzyme inhibitors so it doesn't let any of those enzymes like the protein be broken down into amino acids so your body can use it yeah so this is this is something that i found out in the whole thing that's why legumes have to be so carefully prepared they have to be so sprouted because the ancient people they knew this already yeah they didn't know the names for it of course <laughs> but they knew it already of the lectins or the phytic acid of the oxalic acid and oxalic acid especially is a very dangerous thing when it comes to women because it could give them uh, you know apart from kidney stones there's also a, a condition called vulvodonia and this vulvodonia will make 
because of all this oxalic acid buildup, it gives you really bad pain when it comes to menstrual cycles. Even in the vagina, it, some many women complain that it hurts a lot, certain especially during sex, and that's because of excess oxalic acid buildup from the plants. So mm. anyone who's listening to this, I would this is my recommendation: make sure you soak a lot of those legumes for at least twelve hours, and that's going to naturally remove some of the lectins and the phytates and the phytic acids yeah but okay so protein you're talking about soy and all the yeah is I just, a, yeah i just want to add to the to the legumes conversation is that we develop um the ability to digest it more over time and mm-hmm. and our gut has the ability to change in our gut microbiome has the ability to change this is why i'm going to advocate for slow change and Mm -hmm. if when it comes to legumes especially it should be a very measured uh adding and adding uh with slow portions um gradually Mm -hmm. to build this um to build the right microbiome and uh in the gut to Mm -hmm. digest this uh because even what I found with myself, I never had a problem with uh, digesting um, legumes or any plants. But some people I saw when they start eating a lot, uh, they start getting the digestive issues. And I think it's because they just... They're eating a lot? <laughs> no, no, because they weren't prepared. Yeah. They weren't prepared. Like uh, the body has the ability to adapt. And even for me now, I think if I eat meat, I I won't be able to digest it because you lose your body. Yeah, every every everything is different now. My body is prepared to digest a lot of legumes, grains, and vegetables, and get the benefit out of them rather than digesting meat. Mm -hmm. So it's all uh, training our body Mm -hmm. as well, and it's gonna adjust. Amazing. Yeah. Soy is interesting because a lot of people would um, argue that soy is not the best for us considering the phytoestrogens that it has, especially for men. And for people who are listening, these are estrogenic compounds that actually compete with our cell surface receptors for estrogen. In men, it makes them estrogen dominant, which then competes for testosterone in the body. And what happens is most of the times when you're eating a lot of soy, and soy even... Well, there's another interesting thing with soy is did you know that um 75 percent to 85 percent of all the soy that is produced in the world actually goes to feeding animals yeah it it's does crazy when i when i knew this and only about six percent is there for human consumption yeah yeah it's <laughs> yeah when i heard this first i was like really like where are all the vegans why are, why are all the animals eating this exactly but, exactly. Uh, but it's yeah it's interesting on how these farming practices are done and how they contribute to a lot of these feed um animal food so okay protein is there protein shakes uh i want to add also on the mm-hmm. soy so this is also interesting that okay uh the it's been the lifelong debate about mm-hmm. soy, I think. And there's good amount of maybe some data that uh, proves that, yes, if you eat a lot of soy, uh, you're going to uh, harm your masculine uh, mm-hmm. hormones and testosterone is going to affect uh, men. But also there is a lot of researches that on the contrary say that. Uh, it helps uh, with prostate cancer and so many researchers that say that no, it does not have a profound effect on men's health. And when you look deeper in the researches that say that soy does affect mm-hmm. um, men, then you look... Women as well. And like a lot of estrogen for women is also not a good but idea. But then you have to look at the amount of soy that's... Mm-hmm was given to the participants of the studies it's, how much uh, soy are they getting it's uh, i read a couple of studies and it was like 
crazy amount like um, I can't I can say the number now mm -hmm. but it's maybe more than 500 grams of soy per day mm -hmm. which is like more than a block of soy more than a block of tofu mm -hmm. which is nobody gonna eat so much in a day what if you want to get maximize your protein would you not eat so much uh or not, you would distribute it from other not, sources not as much as uh, they are saying in the studies okay. definitely that's like too much mm -hmm. uh basically what they were what they were given they were given soy three times a day um yeah it was one block three times a day so that's that that's like a vegan bodybuilding diet oh but not even like when you're a vegan bodybuilder you mm -hmm. You spread your uh, choices. You don't eat one block of soy uh, mm -hmm. every meal. You have your um, maybe protein shake. You have your legumes that give you additional protein. You have, of course, carbs, but yeah. also they give you your what additional What about fat? Protein. Because when I was vegan, uh, when I was on the vegan diet, there was some, um, some movement or some people that said, oh, fat is really bad and, you know, I don't have any fat. So I actually did not have a lot of fat on the vegan diet i made that mistake yeah we need fat we need every nutrient in the right balance and fat we need uh for a lot of functions of in our body and uh, so you advise your clients to eat fat yes okay, cool. eat That's fat good. but differentiate which fat you're eating mm -hmm. uh don't eat trans fat don't don't eat uh saturated fat mm -hmm. Uh, a lot we still need it uh, in the in the right amounts mm -hmm. thank god you said it <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah we still need it in the right amount but uh, the problem now is that there's excess of saturated fat mm -hmm. and uh, many things that's why we just need to be careful uh, but trans fat it's something that we need to cancel and trans fat is something that you can find in like cookies and yeah you don't find it in natural there are no trans fats yeah. in legumes right yeah yeah there's no trans fats i mean unless they do something with these legumes i don't know like mash it deep fried i don't know what mm -hmm. make it into sausage then yeah then probably they're gonna have there's gonna be some trans fats over there what about deficiencies when i was on a vegan diet i knew that one of the things that I was supplementing with was B12. Yeah. Because B12 is normally you get it from animal products. Yeah. But over the last couple of years, I found out there are more things, things like carnosine, creatine, DHA, um, zinc, arguably iron. Um, I would say more of like iron is more important because as you said the absorption of people are different mm -hmm. and other things you can get from plant diet with no problem but you have to really check uh, on work what works with you for mm -hmm. example my story i was anemic all my life before mm -hmm. i became vegan mm -hmm. that's that's like something that blew my mind because I was eating meat. I loved meat. Mm -hmm. I was such a big meat eater. My family always um, was saying that if there's no meat or fish or eggs or any animal product in the meal, then it's not even a meal. Like you can't mm -hmm. even count that because it's like a rabbit food. <laughs> rabbit food. I yeah. Like it. Yeah. And uh at that time, I was anemic all the time. Doctors were telling me uh, that I have low iron and it's it's been all my life until I became vegan. And then after one year, I was concerned that maybe my iron is low because, you mm -hmm. know, everybody was telling me that. And I checked myself and I'm fine. First mm -hmm. time in my life, I'm fine when I'm not eating any meat. That blew my mind. Plus another thing, since the age of um, six, I think, six or eight, uh, I had like a very bad um, virus and uh, I, I had like a heart problem after that virus. Like I was in the hospital and since the young age, I have this heart uh, deficiency. And uh, I was competing in uh, track and field and I was 
oh, I had to pay the doctors to let me go to the competition because they didn't <laughs> let me go because of my heart yeah. problem. And when I went vegan after one year, I checked everything. I checked my iron. My iron was fine. Checked my heart. My heart was fine. What do you think happened there? What was that? Why would you think, okay, with a lot of these plant matter does contain non-heme iron, so I could understand. And then if you want to enhance the, that's a bio, that's a hack that I tell bio-hack, people. Yeah, with the vitamin C. Exactly. Yes. You do it with vitamin C and then it works magic. But yeah. with the heart thing, what do you think happened there? Uh, what I think happened is that meat has a lot of saturated fat that, of course, mm-hmm. um, it affects our heart. Yeah. And in general, uh, in general, uh, animal products can contain other um, things like hormones that they were mm-hmm. fed and um, maybe some preservatives and things that they put in the meat to make it more, more like big, more juicy. Yeah. The chickens, chickens used to be like this small before. And now mm. if you look at the chicken, like they make it this big yeah, because it's fed with growth hormone yeah, and testosterone. It, yeah. It's fed with all of these things. So uh, when you eat it, of course, you don't think that it's never going to affect you. So that's what's happening. And also, in general, when you eat more plants, uh, you are protecting your heart because of all of the uh, phytonutrients Mm -hmm. and much more vitamins. Plus, I started to eat a big variety of vegetables. uh, So lots of fiber. Lots of fiber, uh, legumes that I didn't used to eat before. I never Mm -hmm. ate legumes. It wasn't just like something that we would eat. And I never came across. It's not it. even available in that part of the world, right? Yeah, I mean it's available, but it's not common. Like we don't have any dish with. Uh, but I'm saying it's not Russia. naturally there in like yeah. traditions. Yeah, it's not really naturally there in. Like if Russian you go to culture. India, it's everywhere. Yeah, right? but in Russian culture, no. Russian mm-hmm. culture is a very high on meat, meat and dairy, yeah. and also soy. Mm. I never knew what tofu is, never knew what tempeh is uh, before I went vegan. So what's tempeh and what's tofu? Tell us. So tofu is like uh, cluttered and pressed uh, soybeans. Okay. And tempeh is whole fermented uh, soybeans. So I'm already liking tempeh because it's fermented. It's actually as a protein and as a food it's the best food you can eat because it's super high on quality lean vegan protein Mm -hmm. and it's fermented. So it's super good for your gut. It Mm -hmm. plants the good gut bacteria that you need uh, to support your health. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what happened to me. And that's... Overall, your health just improved. Yes, yes. But there is this one thing that happens to most... Every time you go vegan for the first three months, you feel amazing. I remember my first three months on a vegan diet, I felt light. I lost so much weight. My energy levels skyrocketed. I was even competing, like doing CrossFit and stuff at that time. So yeah, I remember that first three months, once you get over the discomfort and if you don't have any cravings, then it looks, it's fantastic. And then of course that energy starts tapering down because you cannot be high all the time. Okay, so cool. So we have addressed any other supplements that you recommend taking while on a vegan diet? Anything mm. that you take personally? What, what's your supplement stack? Like you're an athlete, you're um, going to the gym, you're, you know, training other people. What's your, what's your supplement routine look like? My supplement routine look like only a multivitamin. Mm-hmm. That's a vegan multivitamin that contains a sub- I substantial amount of b12 Mm -hmm. and that's it okay that's it because i am i think we can get all of the vitamins and nutrients from our diet if we balance it correctly Mm -hmm. and this is what i've seen throughout my i'm already on the sixth year of being vegan and i never took any supplements 
before I was taking, like I was trying to take iron, I was trying to take vitamin C and zinc and like trying to feel better. But and maybe the multivitamin fills it all. Uh, that's that's true. Uh, although, you know, that vitamins can compete between each other yeah. and it, you never can get like a whole range of all of the vitamins. Yeah, especially from a multivitamin because yes. the, the, the quantities are so small. Yes. What about magnesium or vitamin D3 or yeah. anything like this? You take nothing at all? Nothing at all. D3, I go outside to get my son mm -hmm. and uh, all the other things uh, can get can be get from the diet, uh, mm -hmm. can be obtained from the diet. Um, the trick here is to eat a variety of food, like a big variety of foods. Don't stick to only one like type of foods i saw i saw some people like only eating like rice chicken and tomatoes mm -hmm. and like in a different combination every day you have to include uh all of the different foods and vegetables all of the colors to be sure that you don't need you don't need ever multivitamin and you can get all of the vitamins from your diet and that's what I've been doing for all these years. And I check myself every year mm -hmm. for deficiencies. I check everything. Like I What's go your vitamin D level look like? I'm yeah. just curious. Yeah, it's all it's always in the healthy range. Okay. Always in the healthy range. And uh, I go to Russia all the time, like once a year, and it's very cheap there. So I check everything I can. And yes, uh, only with the multivitamins, uh, I don't have any deficiencies. Mm -hmm which can be surprising. At first, it was surprising for me as well, but then I understood that mm -hmm. everything is there already. Like, okay. you don't need um, uh, this huge stack of supplements. Also, because if you're eating enough already, some of them can be even toxic for you. Like mm -hmm. vitamin A, uh, vitamin B can be toxic if in a big amounts. Zinc can be very toxic if yep. you have enough zinc, like... Uh, and you just randomly start taking zinc because you heard like, oh, zinc, we, we need to take zinc. So how does someone get over all this confusion? Because right now with, um, you know, there is a world of podcasting, there is a world of social media where a lot of short content has been pushed and, you know, someone comes in with a study of zinc and then everyone jumps on zinc. Yeah. It's, it's like that diet, right? Yeah. It's just a modern way of doing the same thing. So how does, what what do you recommend when people look at these things, your clients, they come to you, do you, they have to do a completely blood analysis to look at what nutrients they're lacking and only then they supplement? Or are those yeah. are there some supplements that are safe for everyone? Like, yeah. what do you think about this I whole would world say, of supplementation and confusion? Yeah, I would say that um, a multivitamin can be a good way to make sure that you are not lacking anything. Mm -hmm. um, it's not a treatment, it's not a prescription. A multivitamin is accessible to everyone and it contains a wide range of things that you uh, that you can be benefiting from. Uh, er, anything beyond that, uh, I would say consult with the doctor. With the doctor, okay. Yeah. So she, she has a completely anti-biohacking approach. <laughs> we're just popping pills all day long just to make sure we're reversing a lot of these things. But anyway... <laughs> Um, let's move on. Does what, what's your, so you, you mentioned that you went to the gym before this, how often do you train? Why, what kind of a training do you think is good for everyone? Like what's your, what's your thought on training? Yeah. Um, I think that everybody should move mm -hmm. in the way that, uh, they like, and that suits them. Not everybody uh, need to go to the gym not everybody um, needs and most people don't like to go to the gym yeah right? yeah do and you get this all the time like people tell you gym is so boring i cannot go to the gym yeah um you know people know it but then the culture of the dieting and that you have to go to the gym to lose weight and you have to do this and you have to push yourself the culture of this they, it makes them believe that that's what they want and that's what they need. But some people, especially women uh, with uh, hormonal issues, mm -hmm. have to really look at what uh, type of movement they are doing at what time of their cycle. Because uh, 
if you go to your if you go to the gym and try to push yourself to the max and increase your uh, cortisol, then you may be suppressing uh, some hormones that you need at the special period of your cycle. Interesting. Yeah, for example, like when I'm about to uh, enter the menstruation uh, phase, uh, I need the progesterone to come and start working so I can release uh, the uterus lining. And if I'm going and I'm increasing my cortisol and I'm stressing so much and I'm... Which will be from going to the gym and... Which, yeah, yeah, which will be from going to the gym and increasing my inflammation, although like it's a good inflammation, but it's increasing... The progesterone can be shy, and especially if it's already shy, naturally, uh, how uh, I am, like with PCOS, mm -hmm. people like me have to be really careful what they do. Um, even ice bath at the wrong time can scare out the progesterone and... Uh, be because of this shock, the body is in shock and progesterone doesn't want to come because it thinks that it's not the right time. The The body is not ready. There's something's going on. Something is bad. Something is uh, dangerous out there. So it's not the right time to get pregnant because this mm -hmm. is what this is what the uh, woman body is designed to do. It's designed to do this so you have a chance to get pregnant. And... Um, if you are suppressing this, if you're giving the, your body a si sign that this is too stressful, this is too dangerous, then it's going to push back and it's going to start creating this problem. So this is before you enter the menstrual cycle? Yeah. So then we look at, so does that mean that before, so if you know your menstrual cycle will come on the 15th, for example, a few days before the 15th, you don't go to the gym or you do some light training or you just make yeah. your body less stressful whether it's from gym or from um, from your work or some other kind of stress yeah. so the idea is to keep the stress low at this yeah. time the idea is to keep the stress low and at this period of time this is naturally we want to eat more carbs and a lot of women are not honoring honoring this and uh, people who are doing fasting for example this is completely um it's not right to do at this uh, phase because of this uh, all of the stress and we need to nurture our body more at that time we need to uh let uh, make the stress less um maybe meditate uh, if you Movement is good, but also the right type of movement. It should be more feminine movement, more uh, the movement that's going to support your feminine hormones, the, that's going to support your uh, well-being and your uh, lower your stress, like yoga, like but also um, calmer uh, yoga, not like the ones that there's... Not doing a handstand um, for uh, a few minutes. It, Depends on it depends on the body, of course. Depends on what you're used to tolerate. Depends on what your normal routine is. If you never done yoga or any like movement before going uh, to the handstand, uh, this time also won't be uh, good for you. Mm -hmm. But if you're like doing gym hard and uh, pushing yourself, then moving to the yoga when you don't have to push yourself too much and you can be in a flow you can uh, breathe and you can relieve the stress then that's going to be the right time and when do you kick on the intensity uh after the menstruation phase finishes that's that's when we can tolerate the longer fasts. Mm -hmm. That's when we can tolerate low carb diet. That's when we can push ourselves in the gym. We have more energy we have um, the the rise of the hormones and uh, that's when we can tolerate a, lo a lot of stress. Okay. And generally, what kind of a training do you... So moving is good, but should it be more cardiovascular based, more mobility based, more resistance based? Or, yeah, what's your, what's your take on that? What do you think? Yeah. Let's talk about women for now. Yeah. I think... Um, combination of the of these types is important so we do need some resistance training um as well as mobility flexibility we need to combine it with uh cardio as well uh shouldn't be just one type mm -hmm. i believe because i believe in balance mm -hmm. so everybody should um 
figure out the plan that they can follow and that feels best for them because there's no universal uh, like set of things that you can do, especially for women, because we are so different and so we can... Um, so you shouldn't just follow someone who's doing a workout on Instagram? Yes, definitely not. You should follow what your body is more comfortable to do, what mm -hmm. feels best for you and what makes you feel best. That sometimes we try to push ourselves and go and um, run for one hour when we don't really feel like But I I believe that if you like you need to do some movement and if running for one hour is not what you like to do is not what you want to do but you like salsa for example and uh you then go to salsa go and do the movement that's going to bring you the joy that's going to bring you this good emotions that's not going to leave you absolutely drained and hating yourself and hating the gym and hating everything because hate is something that you store in the body as well this is something that's gonna be sitting in yourself and affecting your organs and your mindset, your mood, everything, even your digestion, because it's gonna be more stress on yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's say I don't like to go run. That's fine. I can do some salsa. But what about resistance training? If I don't want to go to the gym and then as I'm aging, I can have higher chances of osteopenia. Yeah. And a lot of stuff, especially with women, loss of bone mineral density. Yeah. So if I don't like to go to the gym, what do I do? You can start from somewhere. You don't have to like go into the gym from day what one. What if I don't like to leave my couch at all? What What do I do? Well, you got to compromise then. <laughs> you got to compromise. And uh, for people like this, we start very slow. We start with something that they're ready to do right now. If it's just standing from the couch... And sitting back to it for five times, and that's the comfortable place for them to start, then start from that. Mm -hmm. And we build on this. Maybe tomorrow you're going to do this stand up and sit down for 10 times. And maybe on a, in two weeks, you'll be able to do it without a couch and maybe do some very light movement next to the couch. And then maybe in a month, we can move outside and build what if i don't want to do anything like this but i want a magic pill to make me fit and lose weight then you're gonna fix your mindset okay let's talk about mindset what what is mindset according to you and uh, how do you approach this whole mindset thing um mindset is the very big thing that i focus on as well because this is what we think about ourselves, what we think about um, our practices, what we do and where we sit uh, in the world and what are we trying to achieve mm -hmm. and what do we need to do um, and how do we like it um, to achieve these things that we want. So there's different dimensions uh, to figure out um, the mindset in a way that it can help us get where we want to go, not hinder us. Mm. But most people have the mindset that will actually cause an obstruction. Yes. Do you see that? It's a lot. I see this a yes. lot. A lot of people will be, they want to go to some place or achieve something, but it's at the end, it's their mind itself that actually blocks them from going yes. there. Yes. That's, that's a set of practices that I called the limiting beliefs work. Um, it's also a lot of things to consider, but in the nutshell, uh, what what is it about? It's about a set of beliefs that are limiting us from um, going forward and achieving our goal. Once we set our goal clearly, that's also important to mention, then we have this um, facts about ourselves and about whatever it is in the world that may not, like believing in those will not help us go. Uh, if, for example, if your goal is to lose weight and you believe that I, I, can, never lose I weight. can never lose weight, then you can never lose weight because 
this is the block in your mind of whatever you're going to do, you're not going to achieve a sustainable result. Maybe like if you count your calories and you're going to be so restrictive and whatever, uh, you're going to lose some weight, but then the diet finishes. And because you have this limiting belief of I can never lose weight, you're going to gain back and um, start doing these things that will make you gain back just because you don't believe it and it's something new for everybody. It's uncomfortable because it doesn't come together. Like I lost weight, but I don't believe that I'm, I can lose weight. So we need to gain back quickly. Yeah, so there's because, a friction in the mind. Yeah, because it doesn't, uh, it doesn't uh, match. So what do you do if like someone who's listening to this and they want to lose weight or they want to be healthy? Let's say me, CJ, I want to be healthy, but I have this deep belief that I can never be healthy because of my past or everyone in my generation has never been healthy or because someone told me in school that I'll never be healthy. Yeah. So in a nutshell, what would be your approach to yeah. this CJ? I hope I'm never like this. But <laughs> <laughs> well, at the beginning, um, it's very useful to recognize where's the root cause. Where, where is it coming from? Like who, who said it to you? Like if it's bullies in school. Yeah. yeah if it's bullies in school, or if it's your parents, or if it's somewhere. Oh, yeah, of course, parents forgot those bullies. Yeah, so <laughs> parents are big bullies in everyone's life. So yeah, most that's of the people true. blame their parents. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you have to recognize where it's coming from. Uh, you have to recognize. So it came from the parents. It came from the parents. Okay. You have to recognize that this belief is hindering you and it's not true. Okay, so and, I recognize that this belief is somehow limiting me. That's why I come yeah. and ask for help. Okay, perfect. Yeah. I've realized that was the next step. You have to you have to find proof that it's not true. You have to find proof. Um that, you know that most of the people don't even have the like at the beginning, maybe they um they they're gonna notice that okay, this is maybe hindering me. But uh, when actually coming to, okay, you have to recognize that it's not true. Simple as that. But they're like, but they believe in it. Mm -hmm. How can I recognize? Can we put some electrodes on their health and shock their brains to forget them? I think this is uh, <laughs> your part of the story. You tell me, can they? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, we can boost certain things with electrodes and yeah, a few other biohacking stuff. But yeah, okay, con continue. Let's, yeah. let's go the classic way. Yeah, the classic way is just the talk down. You have to recognize that it's not true mm -hmm. by finding the proof, whether it's a proof from anywhere. Best if it's the proof from your own life, from your past experiences, from anywhere. Um, usually, if um, this is your belief, um, like, for example, uh, you can't uh, ever be healthy. Mm -hmm. This is so general and you have to find as much proof as you can that you can be healthy. Like what's healthy in you right now? Like you're walking, like your arms are working, like mm -hmm. your legs are working, like your brain is working. This is healthy. This is healthy. This is healthy. This is healthy. You list all of these things. Okay. So you list down the smaller things that will contribute to the bigger yes. faculty of health. Yes. Okay. So this is, this is recognizing that the belief in us true, like you break in it. And, uh, Sometimes it's hard to recognize it. Alone, and, you mean? Uh, either alone or e either like some beliefs are strong and deep rooted. And it like just like this, by listing things, it's not always going to happen. So you have to work with someone who can show you the way? Uh, you have to work with someone and uh, you have to, like the, in the practice that I do, we, uh, it's a practice that we do every day. So, yes, we did the work to list the things, but it's not going to go away just like this. It's not a biohack, like there's not an electroshock. So you have to bring the awareness every day to seek the mm -hmm. proof. If, the, if you can't find the proof, you have to seek for the proof. And once you seek for the proof and you, uh, you find it, like smallest things, you, you list those. And when you do it every day after... Uh, like a couple of weeks sometimes, a couple of months sometimes, depending on how rooted and how strong is the belief, how strong was the damage, uh, it starts reframing itself because you start focusing on the counter-belief. 
mm-hmm. on the things that uh, support the counter belief. How long would I need to do this to reverse my mindset? Yeah, it depends on how many beliefs you have. Mm-hmm. Let's say there was one belief. It's never, it's never one belief, but uh, let's say it's what it was one. Uh, depends on you. Depends um, on how strong it was. Again, mm-hmm. it can be a couple of weeks, can be a couple of months. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. Yes. Interesting. Let's shift gears. What have you found recently in the health and wellness space or in the nutrition or something that is new that you have started incorporating in your practice and you have seen like tremendous ROI on it? Uh, I think first one is gratitude. Just saying thank you or writing thank you or Uh, how do you define gratitude in your own own words? Gratitude as a practice of... um, I write it down. I write it down on a like deeper level, not just like thanks CJ for the podcast. <laughs> thank, uh, thank my car to bring me to the podcast. Mm-hmm. Of course, this is good, but um, deeper, deeper gratitudes and us uh, like everything, smaller things. Give us an example. Uh, some example for uh, let me think. Thank you, CJ. <laughs> Thank you, CJ. And how do you make it this deeper? Uh, for what value did you bring to my life and uh, what value maybe I brought to you and mm-hmm. what, uh, how can it, uh, how did it affect uh, my mood and maybe my life? So mm-hmm. it's like good, proper, uh, deep piece of gratitude that mm-hmm. I would write down. How many of these? Uh, I aim for at least five. Five per day? Yeah. Five. Do you remember five things to be grateful for per day? Uh, it's sometimes very small things. For mm-hmm. example, uh, I don't know, the guy on a gas station uh, wiped my glass and uh, I smiled at him uh, because I wanted to make his day better. And I don't know, I gave him some money and uh, gratitude for myself that maybe I didn't want to smile the day, but I wanted to make his day better. And um, like by doing this, I make also, like I grow myself in this way. Mm-hmm. So feeling this and feeling the gratitude for the guy to wipe my glass and make my car cleaner and make mm-hmm. me, uh, I don't know, see the w- road and not die because my glass was... Uh, yeah, there are many things to be grateful for. Yeah. But what's funny is the way that our human brain operates is that you're designed to forget anything that that's good. is good. Yeah. So that's how our brain operates because it needs to be in this whole survival and scanning process. So most of the times... At the end of the day, people will, even if these things have happened to you and you have remembered at that point that I'm so grateful and you've offered some gratitude, when it comes to writing down at the end of the day or the end of the week, most people will forget even the best things that has happened to them. And that's because our brain is designed in a way. But if you ask them, what was the worst thing that has happened to you? Or what's something uncomfortable that has happened to you? And they'll give you an entire list for the entire week. That's really good that you sort of remember it. And five, uh, I have seen good research on writing down five things that you're grateful for per week, not per day, but per week. And what this translates into is that you are you sleep 33% better. Yeah, you sleep better. You're able to work out 30% more. Yeah. And you're just in love with life. Yeah. And your mood, your serotonin, dopamine, all of these things, all these neurochemical yeah. uh, pathways, they increase. So, okay, so you write down five things per day. And how has this changed your life? I noticed a big change in my work and my energy as well, uh, how I approach uh, the day. And... Uh, my sleep was already good, <laughs> but... Uh, You're one of those lucky ones. Uh, you sleep well, right? I sleep well. I can sleep anywhere at any time. <laughs> yeah, and half of the show just are as jealous of you right now. <laughs> well, uh, it's also a practice. I wasn't like this all the time. Mm-hmm. It's So tell us about this. How are, you, how are you able to sleep easily after not being like that? Um, 
because w- why most of the people can't sleep because they overthink stuff. Mm-hmm. Like I hear it so much. I just go to bed and I close my eyes and my brain start doing this washing machine. Like mm-hmm. what happened? I should have said this. I should have said that. What about tomorrow? And this can keep you like for hours and hours. And then you're going to be anxious because, oh my God, I'm not sleeping. I have to wake up so early. Why can't mm-hmm. I sleep? And you become even more anxious. And that's how insomnia starts many people and um so what you have to do is to learn how to let go that's main uh, hack (laughs) Mm -hmm. and how do you how do you let go personally i started from a guided meditation Mm -hmm. before sleep and uh, throughout time i i'm able to do it myself in my in my brain you know when you close your eyes you do the free breaths maybe you do the box breathing and um, you focus on your body you release any tension and because of the scripts that are so stuck in my head now mm-hmm. i'm able to do this myself relax my body relax my brain focus the breathing and then here here we come like three minutes I'm any sleeping. specific meditation or anything that people can look for online uh look for guided meditation for sleep Mm -hmm. Uh, some of them are also cool in terms of uh they add like affirmations or some manifestations Mm -hmm. there uh some of them are very nice because they make you visualize things uh if you're a visual person um it also at the beginning when you visualize it helps you um helps you focus more Mm -hmm. uh, and not overthink about whatever you want to overthink Uh, it helps you focus on whatever they're telling you and just follow uh, imagine whatever they tell you to imagine and it's always um, calming and it's always built in a certain way for us to um, be easily able to wind down yeah two of the resources that i would recommend that people can check out is any NSDR protocol, NSDR, yeah. so non-sleep deep rest protocol, or yoga nidra. Yoga nidra, yes. Yeah, Any of these are beautiful and a very good starting point to yeah. look into it. Okay, so you do gratitude and it makes you feel good. What else have you? What else have you brought to your life recently that um, is a game changer that anyone else can bring into their lives as well? Uh, yeah. Well, the second one would be visualization as mm-hmm. well. Um, it's tied to the... You're closing your eyes and you're visualizing a better future or you're trying to manifest a better future or you're visualizing what's going to go on in the next couple of hours? Yeah, it? it's uh, it's the goal. For example, for the people uh, with some certain health goal, um, I'm... A uh, big advocate for this practice because my clients are more looking uh, to lose weight and um, uh, get better with their medical conditions like diabetes and prediabetes. And um, the practice of visual visualization of how you, uh, what person you're going to become once you're dealt with this, uh, what you're going to be doing, what you're going to be uh, how you're gonna be feeling? How, uh, what people you're gonna meet because of this? Like, what milestones you're gonna be able to achieve at your work because of this? Uh, for like five or even three minutes a day, mm-hmm. it's a very powerful practice to bring you in the mindset of not um, cheating, not cheating, but okay, staying more consistent. Mm-hmm. So it's like a motivation hack as well. Motivation, yes. Okay. Yes. So you close your eyes and start imagining yourself how you will feel when it's over or when you achieve the goal, how yeah. others around you would feel, what kind of person you would be. And you basically step into a future reality of your own self. Yes, yes. And okay. then if you do it in the morning, then the whole day, you you may notice that you start acting from the point of that future self that, that it's already happened and when you start it as if it's already happened then you're just bringing this future closer to mm-hmm. you by also doing the right practices because you probably won't be eating five packages of chocolate a day mm-hmm. uh if you're in that future that you want 
Okay, so that's interesting because a lot of the times, a lot of this manifestation and visualization, they imagine, they ask you to imagine a better future. But what a lot of those people don't tell you is that you have to bring that future or you have to step into that future self. And you you were correct. You have to start acting life. It's already happened. Yeah. And that change then accelerates things like quantum physics and quantum biology, where, you know, the future and the and the current, they start coming closer. And if not, it's the one way to say it is quantum mechanics and quantum biology, or else it's like fake it till you make it. Yeah, fake but, it till you make it. Yeah, so in either scenario, that's going to be good. Okay, cool. Anything else? Um, yeah, at this point, uh, like from the recent ones. I love that she hasn't mentioned any vegan superfoods till now, but <laughs> <laughs> we're talking about visualization and all of this stuff. Because uh, my work is a lot on the mindset. This is what I understood. Because mind governs everything. Mm. Our thoughts uh, creates our action like create our experiences and uh, create and uh, create our um what we do affect our actions mm -hmm. if we don't think of the action first we're not going to do the action mm -hmm. the right action maybe we're going to do uh as part of the behavior maybe the some wrong compulsive action. action yeah some wrong action that's mm -hmm. not going to bring us to our goals so if you want to be consistent and if you want to reach your goal uh, then mindset is important. Thoughts are important. All of these practices are crucial. So like even that means to bring all of these things into action, of course, you can read 10,000 books on it and you know you could hear a lot of podcasts, but I think stepping up your consciousness yeah. where you're consciously looking at something and under not being compulsive because this is a thing that I see with a lot of people. They get a little bit stressed yeah. and they're on this autopilot behavior where they'll reach out for those chocolates or they'll switch on the Netflix and have the popcorn. But if you take some time to take a step back and look at the situation and you know that you are driven by a set of comp compulsive memory and it's just your body repeating that memory again and again and again, if you take a break from that and you say, okay, my future self is not going to be, or is not, this is not an action that my future self is going to do. So today I'm going to change that and do something else. Yeah, that's And true. once you do something else, you start even, and it's like a muscle, right? Because in um, neuroscience, there's a rule, it's called the Hebb's law, which neurons that wire together, fire together. So every time you start doing something else, those neural networks are firing and wiring and now this becomes your new state of being yes, so yes. this is this is fantastic i mean you know we've been talking for quite some time and i think we can keep on going <laughs> for hours that's what happens when two uh, people who are passionate about health meet but i don't want to take a lot of time if you had a time machine and you could reverse time or you could go back you know one of those back to future back to past things you could go back to your younger self and give yourself one piece of advice. What would that be? Stop dieting. <laughs> Stop dieting. Stop dieting. Okay. I was doing track and field and uh, I was always dieting because I was pushed into this. Oh, you have to be smaller than you. You're too big. Mm -hmm. You're too bulky. Or modeling. Same thing. And modeling also. But modeling came later. I was mm -hmm. track and field. It's... Uh, this is something that really affected me in life, mm -hmm. and uh, I was. That's why I was always trying to lose weight. I was like, "Yay! If I'm lighter, I'm gonna be able to fly." You know, because I was doing the long jump, I was be I will be able to be um, in the in the air more. So I'm gonna be jumping um, longer if I'm mm -hmm. more light. But I was missing the point that I'm not gonna be have enough power and strength to do the push to yeah, actually put myself up in the air except of being just light and in the air mm -hmm. so it's not about that and i wasn't told that and i was trying to diet and um i was really um stealing my results from myself because of this okay so younger generation generation z or y or what's the latest generation called 
X? X? Okay. I don't know. So Generation <laughs> X. Yeah, Generation Z is a, a worse idea because, you know, it's shouldn't be that last letter. Should be generation A, B, C, D, and it could keep on continuing. But generation Z is like the last letter in the yeah. alphabet. And looks like if you don't really do a lot of things for the environment, this could be one of those last generations. So <laughs> generation Z is a bad idea. Change to something else. But all of you guys who are listening, don't diet. Like she said, figure out your own biology, your biochemical individuality. Um, and if you need some help, Raise your hand. There are a lot of resources on the internet. You can reach out to people like Kat who are in this field to help you out because she's gone through, like you've heard on this podcast, she's gone through her own set of journeys, figured out what's the best way to hack it. So now you don't have to go through the same thing. I think this hiring a coach, hiring someone who can mentor you having someone who can guide you through something only because they've gone through the same thing themselves is the biggest biohack that you can have because this just cuts short a lot of sufferings a lot of trial and error i mean if i could just imagine if i got a coach a long time back my life would be i would be 10 10x not 10 steps but 10x ahead but again everyone has their own life journey but don't make it hard um because that's that's a very linear growth and with humanity and with the way things are going right now we don't want to achieve a linear growth we want to achieve an exponential growth so if you want to grow exponentially hire someone hire a coach get a mentor read self-educate do something and if people want to get to you what's the best way to get in touch with you uh, I do have a website where you can um, fill the form uh, to me to contact you and settle our um, free initial talk. Oh, you get a free initial talk. That's cool. Yes. So I, what happens in this free initial call? The initial consultation is for us to get to know each other, for me to dive deep uh, into uh, your situation, uh, your story, uh, give you some insights and recommendations and also explain how we work and discuss on how can we agree on working together mm -hmm. because there is no one also universal way i work with people okay uh, there's stuff that can be added removed and the program is completely customizable and individual for everyone mm -hmm. that's why the initial call is important to agree on all of these things okay cool perfect so if you want to get a free initial call what's the website again website is healthbycat.com healthbycat.com we're going to put it in the show notes so you can get to it easily any other ways instagram yeah. uh, facebook uh instagram at healthbycat underscore uh you can also dm me there and it's okay. going to be basically the same thing Get All right, so website. go to the website. It's easy. Held by cat underscore is the Instagram. Held by cat dot com is the website for you guys. And um, Kat, thank you so much. I had an amazing conversation. This was fun. Thank you, CJ. Of course, my gratitude to you. <laughs> and uh, my gratitude to all of you for tuning in, spending some time with us, understanding more about your health, being curious. I really appreciate Kat and I really appreciate all of you guys who are listening to us right now. Everyone have a great week. Have a great month. Have a great year. Have a great lifetime. Take care, guys. Bye.